Thursday. The- <laughs> Uh, you see, I mean, very few things can stop me in my tracks, but that just did it. Um, you know, we'll address that in a few minutes after I get through the mandatory opening here. Man, that caught me. And it did catch me off guard. Not Christine Lagarde off guard, which we'll also discuss. But this is Market Call. It is the 16th, I believe, of March. Is that right? Holy cow. 16th of March, Thursday. Today's Market Call is brought to you by... FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. There are data providers as well. And of course, you see her there. So it is a SoFi day. Get your money right all in one app. It's just the two of us as the song goes, as your tweet goes. Uh, The last time this happened around this time of year, you brought with you props. And clearly that is the case yet again. Yeah, not as exciting this year, but... You missed one of the highlights of what's going on. March Madness started today. Yes. I believe uh, West Virginia is playing Maryland. I usually really like Maryland because they've got that, the Terrapins thing, which I've always, which is a turtle, I believe. Uh, I've always thought that was pretty funny, but I chose West Virginia in this one because of a John Denver song (laughs) called Country Roads. (laughs) (laughs) Listen, makes perfect sense to me. I I mean, People typically win these tournaments based on stuff just like that. I will tell you, I think a terrapin, you're right, is some sort of cross between a tortoise tortoise and a turtle. Um, It's also the name of a Grateful Dead album, Terrapin Station. And now if Dan were here, he'd be texting me like, can we get on with it, please? Can you shut up? But he's he's not here. So can you hold that plate up again? Because that's disturbing. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, Here it is, folks. I don't know if we're feeling this way, yeah. but no, uh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, anyway. again, you know, my Sicilian slash Italian heritage prohibits me from donning anything green on these next few days. But that's for another show. But here we are. It's EY from SoFi. It's G Swizzle. We're now four minutes in or three minutes in. We haven't <laughs> talked about anything markets, but <laughs> let's roll a tweet from the great uh, David Rosenberg. As Dan yeah. says, we call him Rosie. And he's pointing out the following. Take a good hard look at this chart and tell me where we are heading into a soft or no landing. More like a crash landing. His words, not mine. Philly Fed at a level that is eight for eight on recession calls with no head fake. So there's one of your inputs. Um, the other input, obviously, is something we'll discuss that you've been talking about. When the yield curve inverts to the magnitude that it does, and then it starts to right itself as much as people want to say that's a good sign, that's not a bad sign. So let's talk about this one real quick, EY. Yeah, I was just trying to pull up a real-time read on where the yield curve inversion is. Last time I checked, it was only about 50 basis points. Uh, here's the thing. I think I said this last time, or maybe it was on the podcast on Monday. The inversion is just the like yellow light, yellow flag. That's mm-hmm. the signal to keep your eyes wide open. Because as we know, there have been inversions that were not followed by recessions. But an inversion that is as deep as it got to 110 basis points, and it's been going on as long as it has now about a year almost, I think we're about a month shy of a year, that's more than a signal. That's more than something just to watch. And yes, when it starts to uninvert or re-steepen, call it what you will, that usually happens because the market, the economy has gotten to the point where we've gotten worried enough that it means that the Fed probably has to think about cutting rates sooner rather than later. The chances of them cutting rates uh, right now, given the events of the last week, are higher because of bad things, right? Because something broke in the economy, something broke in the market, something broke in the liquidity system. So that's not usually a good reaction. It's not mm-hmm. a good reason for the yield curve to be steepening. There is, there's some stats out there you can say about on average, it's like three to four months afterwards that the recession starts. My spidey sense says that once it hits zero, we're already right in it. And I don't know how long that's going to take. I know that you probably have a take. It's going to it's going to go down again. But I don't think that we necessarily need to look at, OK, when's the point where the yield curve inversion hits zero? And that's the real signal. I think the fact that we've already erased 60 basis points of the inversion uh, in the last week is the biggest deal. Yeah. And in a meaningful, swift way, which leads me and I, by the way, I've agreed with you and I agree with your assessment now. But Lisa Abramowitz. That name typically thinks, you know, I hearken to sort of linebackers of the 1960s for 500, please. That's like a Green Bay (laughs) Packer type of name, but I don't think she played for the Packers, nor would she be happy that I said that. 
They call but her Bramo for short. You, Tom, you do. At least. Tom Keen, Tom Keen calls her Bramo, I think. I like that. All right. So you know what? If it's good for him, it's good for me. So Bramo says, the last time we saw this amount of impl- implied volatility in U.S. Treasury yields was December of 08. And I think we all sort of remember what was transpiring back then. And I brought it up yesterday with Carter Braxton Worth that, you know, we had seen an instrument that trades on the CME, TVL, I believe, traded levels we last saw. And that's, again, uh, bond market volatility trades at levels we last saw in the beginning of COVID, March of 2020. So these are not again, we're not just pointing this out just to sort of um, fortify or reinforce our thesis. I mean, this is real shit that's going on. I mean, I'm not making this up. So this is out there as well. And again, it speaks to what you're saying. I don't know at this point what the yield curve will do or what it has to do. But I think it's done enough now to sort of set the wheels in motion for everything that Liz was just saying. And we had well, to- the other the other thing, though, too, is look at what happened in the Fed funds futures over the last not even full week. Right. Over the last couple of days. I mean, yesterday I was writing my blog post and literally in the midst of writing the sentence of what the market was expecting, it swung like 25 percent. I think at this point we're back to a 75 ish percent probability of a 25 basis point hike. But by the way, there was something on that plate before, and I'm going to use it now. Mm. We went from the probability of a 50%, or I'm sorry, a 50 basis point hike to the probability of, a, this is a green bagel. No, a it's not. Please tell it me is. that's not what that is. It's a green bagel. Yep. I, okay. But it was two halves. I know it's not a perfect circle. It looks like a heart. No, anyway. and it actually, and before you even <laughs> continue to speak, can you hold that up again? Because- the way you help, that is not, there's something like that. Those are not a match set for you. No, days they were, of thunder. They were like this. There. We cut them, we cut them in half. So I had to do that. I don't have any full bagels. Yeah, anyway. Noted. Um, Please continue. Yeah, we're trying to do portion control here at SoFi. <laughs> Clearly unsuccessfully. <laughs> anyway, we went from, in less than a week, in like two or three days, we went from expecting 50 basis points in a hike to zero basis points and then cuts later this year. It swings so wildly. And and we'll talk about that in my note uh, later on in the show. But things move so fast. This is why, this is exactly why people like us have been talking about it for so long and trying to warn market participants. Because here's the thing, you can't buy insurance when the firefighters are in your driveway. Okay, you have to be ready for it before then. The VIX spikes so fast, the move index spikes so fast. Everything moves so quickly. You cannot catch that boulder that is rolling down a hill. That, that's that, tr- true words. As much as you'd like those, because I know they typically are very cute. They make posters <laughs> about those guys. I mean, <laughs> you may want them in your driveway, but not because your house is on fire, but it's neither here nor there. So when I saw, I saw a couple things this morning. Uh, the fr- we don't have a slide for this, but you and I were talking about it. The fact that the ECB held fast, held serve, and went 50 basis points I'm actually shocked because they actually I think they did the right thing. But I thought the ramifications for the broader market would be such that we'd sell off in a meaningful way. My thinking being that if they held serve, it's going to be very difficult for our Federal Reserve not to act in kind. We actually do have the slide, so I apologize. But here we go. So, again, I think they did the right thing. We'll see how it plays itself out. They're saying inflation is still a bigger problem than whatever systemic risk people are talking about, which I happen to agree with as well. What are your thoughts on this? So here's the thing. Inflation is actually a bigger problem in Europe. If you look at the blended rate, the CPI rate for the Eurozone, it's eight, it was 8.6 last month. We're going to get another number, I believe tomorrow. um, And it's expected to be 8.5. So it is higher than the U S if you look at the European union altogether. So that brings in obviously more volatile countries with different, currencies, the inflation rate is actually at like 10%. So they have a a pretty big problem over there. There's peaked out higher than ours and is still stuck higher than ours. However, they obviously had a large bank that needed to be bailed out this week. Mm -hmm. And that was not necessarily an entirely different scenario than what happened here, but that was a bailout basically of the equity as well. Whereas we all know that what happened here was more of a bailout of the depositors and not necessarily what was happening in the stock market. So I think, you know, as I was writing my note and and I kind of left it open ended because things were moving so fast. If I had to say today what I think the Fed is going to do, I think they should hike 25 basis points now. And I said in my note multiple times, I don't get a vote. Powell doesn't call me 
which he probably shouldn't. <laughs> but if I had a vote, I would vote for 25, not because I want more to break, but because inflation at 6% just becomes a bigger problem later. And yes, what we're going through is a disinflationary force. I would expect it to have disinflationary pressure on those numbers in the next month or two, but that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. And it can swing right back up if we don't take care of it. And if we pump liquidity in and we let the market rip, especially, and I know we're gonna talk about this later, especially with the trends in place that are going on right now in the market, that liquidity piece is gonna send inflation higher down the road. Without question. And, you know, that 6% of the, the components of that 6%, the problem, of course, is the things that are becoming disinflationary are not as big a component as the things that are still sticky as hell. And I don't want to get all wonky here, but, you know, they've been able to combat one thing. Unfortunately, the thing that they really need to defeat, they're unable to do it. And, you know, you get back to the services side of the equation, but we'll talk about that at another time. I saw this number come out, jobless claims. I'm like, okay, this makes the Fed's job more difficult as well. So roll that slide because I'm like, you know, the job market is still tight as hell. So U.S. jobless claims dropped by most since July. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, to me, and maybe I'm wrong in my interpretation here, but job market's still tight as hell, EY from SoFi. It is still tight. Uh, and I would still expect things like jolts to come down first. That'll be the, the indicator that softens first. There was an announcement from a company this week about cutting uh, current headcount and cutting the open position. So it might actually start to come down and you'll see it in the jolts numbers soon. I think we might still be, I don't know, a couple months out from when we actually see it in the jobs numbers. But I talked about this, I think last week or the week before about construction employment. Mm -hmm. The jolts numbers for construction have fallen sharply. And that usually does lead the overall labor market by about six to nine months or so. So if those numbers have softened, there's going to be a lag time in between, but I would expect uh, things to show up in the labor market soon enough. Yeah, back half of this year, which I would agree with, but there's a long road to Tipperillo or something was a song when I was a kid. I'm not, I have no idea where Tipperillo is. From my vantage point, it's the things that the old men used to smoke. Now being one of those old men, I could probably <laughs> embrace it. But again, neither here nor there. Now, the S&P 500. So Let's pull up this chart because, again, I find it fascinating. And I talked about this yesterday with Carter. I've talked about it with you just to sort of a highlight and amplify some of the things we've been discussing. The move down we saw a week and a half ago uh, to 3940 in the S&P. That took us down to the 200-day moving average. We bounced from there in a meaningful way. And that caused Mike Wilson, correctly, incorrectly, doesn't matter, to sort of do a tactical, make a tactical call. He said, look, we held the 200-day moving average technically. We are now set up to bounce to about 4150 or so. And I will tell you, you know, if you look at the chart, you can see we got up to about 4080 or thereabouts. And then obviously, with all the nonsense that's been going on over the last few sessions, we had that move down below the 200 day. So as I'm sitting here talking to you, the SP is basically now back through it on the upside. I think it's trained 3955 or thereabouts. So are we meaningfully through it? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, anything can happen in the rest of the day. But here's your battle line. And I think it's fair to point it out that, you know, you have a flattening 200-day moving average and you have a market trying to figure out what is the input we should be most focused on. And for today, at least, it's not inflation. It's not the Fed. Today, it's, it seems like liquidity infusions uh, are what people are focused on. Thoughts on that? Yeah, well, this 200-day moving average, I think I think you said the most important part, it's flattening. It's not mm -hmm. even there's not even a trend to it anymore. It's it's trending sideways, which is about as indecisive as a market can get. If you've got a 200-day moving average, which is almost a year, people, trending sideways, uh, I'm not really sure that that anything interesting is going to happen until we can meaningfully break and close above or below. It constantly is the debate. Are we standing on top of this line or are we standing underneath this line? And, you know, I think the battle cry of the bulls coming into the year was that we had crossed meaningfully above it. And that meant that we were in a new bull market. It was very positive from a technical perspective. But you know what kills technicals is a big event, a big news event. The other thing that I think you know is worth mentioning, aside from the jobs numbers that came out today, housing came in super strong today. You've got housing yeah. starts. I was going to so, bring that. It's crazy strong. Crazy strong. So another thing for the Fed to grapple with as they go into next week, you know, I think that the likelihood of them doing twenty-five is becoming bigger and bigger. 
my problem with it is that I don't think the market likes it either way. If they do 25, they're going to get accused of not paying attention to the fact that there's issues in the system. And are they just trying to push us into a recession on purpose? If they don't do anything, they're going to get accused of you know, not having credibility anymore. You said you wouldn't do this. You're not fighting inflation. It's lose-lose at this yep. point for them. And I don't think the market is going to be happy no matter what. I agree with that. It is. But listen, with that said, they put themselves in this position. I'm going to ask Jacob to do something on the fly here since you brought up housing. And as wrong as I've been in just about everything, you know, we've been right in one of the sectors. And take a look, and I'm just going to pull one up out of thin air, but they all look exactly alike. And if you could, uh, Jacob, pull up a long-term chart of Toll Brothers, T-O-L, I think people would be shocked. Now, if you don't, if you haven't looked at the home builders, you'd be like, there's no freaking way that these stocks are within a whisper of their all-time high. But if we're able to do this, and now I'm begging you to do it, which he's about to do, <laughs> take a look at Toll Brothers here. Um, you know, this is, you go back now to, I want to say, uh, October or December of 2021, and we're approaching it. Another, this one's going to even look even better, I think. Pulte Homes is another one where we're getting off the mat in a meaningful way. That comes out PHM, and we're about to approach, again, all times all time highs we saw in December 2021 which is extraordinarily counterintuitive here. I mean, this is not me making this shit up. I mean, this is the actual chart. We are within a whisper of an all-time high in home builders. Now, you say to yourself, how could that possibly be? And we don't need to necessarily go down this rabbit hole, but what I'll tell you is there are still supply-demand imbalances in housing, and you have interest rates coming down in a meaningful way, and that's why these stocks are doing what they're doing. So just one other input to think about. So if you think the Fed is doing their job or the job is being done for them, take a look at these home builder stocks and it tells an entirely different story. And I'm not asking you to get granular here, but just thoughts on that sort of at a 30,000 foot level. Well, OK, so here's the thing. Home builders are usually the cyclical indicator, right? It shows that people are obviously building new homes, that there's a backlog. We've been dealing with a backlog of new homes for a long time. There's been a shortage of workers in that sector. The backlog is sort of drying up and we know that real estate doesn't show price changes unless the actual house changes hands, okay? So if people are going to move into these new homes that are being built, that means they either have to sell an old one or stop renting something. So at some point, as they move into these new homes, there will be an adjustment in the real estate prices. Also, commercial real estate and residential real estate, despite the fact that, yes, one is business-related, one is consumer-related, they're not completely uncorrelated. And commercial real estate is seeing a lot of stress right now. There have mm -hmm. been a lot of announcements now of defaults. And that's one of those things that once somebody starts to do it, a lot of other people start to do it. I'm not going to compare this to the mortgage crisis because it's absolutely not the same. But you've got a couple businesses defaulting on their real estate loans. You've got businesses pulling out of deals entirely, that's not a good sign. And yes, rates are down. Also, people should know that mortgage rates follow the 10-year treasury yield closer than anything else. So you don't necessarily have to wait for the Fed to move before you know what a mortgage rate is going to do. It follows the 10-year. Rates are down dramatically, so it's going to make affordability seem better, but prices haven't come down yet. So it's really difficult to figure out when or if the real estate market is going to fall my sense is that it will probably fall a little bit later in the year, just from anecdotal evidence of things like people that I know that are in the real estate business who I've talked to and said that there's just inventory, especially in places like New York City, both buying and renting inventory, that's just not moving because there's such a big gap between what people want to pay and what the seller is willing to take. So there's just no movement. And when there's no movement, you don't see it in the numbers. That's right. It, but, but it is, it's just fascinating. I mean, there's so many different cross currents here. And I just thought I'd bring that up because that's clearly one as well. This is the 10 year note, which we'll talk about. But before quickly, let's take a look at the NASDAQ because this looks a lot better than the S&P. And we pointed this out yesterday, the fact that this one traded down to the 200 day and has bounced off it. So unlike the S&P, which traded through it and is now trading at it, this one held and bounced. And the move in some of these names today is, are just eye-opening, to be honest with you. I mean, you look at Facebook through 200 for the first time, Google getting off the mat. I think Microsoft last time I looked was up 10 bucks or so. I mean, it's just nuts. NVIDIA, you know, a name we talk about all the time. But, you know, these NASDAQ high flyers are adding fuel to this fire. Now, maybe it's on the back of um, it's a flight to safety, and I'm using air quotes 
Maybe it's on the back of yields being lower. Maybe it's some combination of those things. But there's no denying the, the move the last couple of days has been extraordinary, EY. Uh, I think it's rates. I think it's rates full stop. And I think that investors are conditioned to believe that when rates fall, growth goes up. And what we're seeing is their opportunity. They, they saw an opportunity to buy a dip and they bought it. And here we are. And you look at some of those names that you mentioned, look at things like ARC taking in $400 mm -hmm. million. Dollars. We had they had net inflows in ARC on Monday of $400 million. That was after Friday when a major bank <laughs> failed. I, mean, it just, I don't mean to laugh, but it's kind of funny, right? So I think that there's this conditioning where people believe that, okay, so that means rates fall and now growth is attractive again right. and the valuations are justifiable. Here's the thing, and I'll, I'll throw people a bone on this a little bit. We know that growth got hit the hardest, obviously, in 2022. It is very possible, and I said this early in the year, I stand by this. It is very possible that if and when we see the drawdown that you and I and Dan have been calling for, that things like cyclicals actually get hit harder. And that it all gets hit because that's just what happens in a crash. But growth doesn't get hit as hard because it already kind of went through its big flush. And it already is going through its cost cutting. It's gone through its layoffs. It's kind of gone through the process. It's just that not everything is going to do it at the same time. So in a drawdown, it is very possible that you are more protected in some of those large cap growth names. But I still believe that on the other side of it, what happens on the other side of bear markets is that you have new leadership. Yeah. And the fact that that hasn't happened yet, that we're still seeing such an appetite for growth in falling rate environments, I think that we are not done with this rolling bear. For those playing our home bingo game, my big flush moment was a few hours ago. Uh, it's neither here nor there. We had the 10-year yield chart up. Let's pull that up quickly just to take a look because we're right at this level. Here's the battle line. So if rates going down is bullish, you have to ask yourself, are we going to hold the 200-day and bounce and yields go back up? So is that – so there's – again, there's so many weird things going on here. Carter and I talked about this. We've opined enough. I want to go to your note because it's great. I was a fan of uh, Credence Clearwater Revival back in my youth. That would be the early 70s. In 1969, uh, they released an album that had the following on it. So slide it, Earl, please. Uh, Bad Moon Rising, which is a really, if you want to know the truth, shitty song. Uh, oddly <laughs> enough, there was a song called Green River on that. And, you know, that's apropos for the time of year. But there's a Bad Moon Rising, and you're pointing it out with these illustrations. So please. That is correct. My mom is the one that got me into CCR. She was a big classic rock fan. So I, mostly no. Bob is Seger. That right? Huge, huge classic rock fan. Tremendous. She listened to it all the time. Bob Seger mostly. My favorite CCR song is Midnight Special, but that's neither here nor there. Bad Moon Rising. Uh, yeah, here's the thing. Anybody out there that wants to be bullish or people that are piling into tech and saying, OK, we got the all clear from the government. We got our bailouts. That's what's going to happen. We got our backstops. Our Fed put is coming, blah, 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 blah. It is not a good sign when anything has to be bailed out. And it is an even worse sign when things like banks have to be bailed out. And now we've got uh, another bank in the U.S. that it sounds as if. The, uh, there are a number of large banks who are being encouraged uh -huh. to give it an infusion of capital. Okay. That is eerily similar to something that happened right around 2008. <laughs> so again, this is not the same type of scenario. There's, I don't, I don't think that there's like a bunch of bad loans on bank balance sheets. You know, we don't have these layers of tranches that nobody understands. I don't think it's the same. We don't have the same overlap of counterparty risk. However, here's the thing we can explain away all of these little intricacies of, you know, the exposure to certain customers, the exposure to certain parts of the industry. Liquidity crunches are universal. And that's just it. That is how it works. There are companies that will absolutely survive it and will probably thrive mm -hmm. into, into it on the other side. And there are financial companies that will survive it and thrive on the other side because they were better prepared. But going into it, none of this, none of the headlines right now are a good sign. So, uh, this bad moon rising, it's not necessarily that I'm saying we're heading into this huge financial crisis. It's just that you have to step back and realize that moves like this in treasury yields, right? We had a two-year yield that dropped over 100 basis points since March 8th. The 10-year down 50-something basis points since that same day. 
These are not moves that scream stable market conditions, okay? And it's not a time that you can say, okay, you know what? Yields were too high. They're coming back down, and now that's good. They're not coming back down because inflation came back down. That would maybe be good, but that is not the case. And we, I think, at this point are running the risk of semi-permanently higher costs of capital, mm -hmm. which, by the way, everybody, is not good for growth stocks. So you have to think through all of the repercussions of that. Somebody asked a question. I lost it now. I don't know where it is. I wish I would have paid attention so we could pull it up. But something like, how could there be a crash if the Fed and the government are backstopping this? Because we're still in a point where there hasn't been defini definitive evidence of an economic downturn. If, even if the Fed is backstopping it. And look look back at all of the recessions in history. When the Fed starts cutting rates, that's when the recession is yep. happening, okay? Even if they're backstopping it, this is a time where I think we're transitioning into bad news is bad news. Any economic data that we get that it's weakening and the fact even if they paused or signal that they might cut later in the year, it's kind of too late, right? Then the economy just has to, it has to run its course. The business cycle has to run its course. I continue to say respect the cycle. I think that's where we're at. That's how a crash would happen. And just to amplify what you said about banks, rates could go to back to zero. But what I'll tell you is lending standards will be more stringent. So the cost of, I don't give a shit where rates go. The cost of capital is going to stay high, in my opinion, based on what just happened. So can almost throw rates out the window in, if you're trying to figure out what banks are going to do on the back side of this. That's just my opinion. The next portion of this is uh, earthquakes and lightning. Very, very frightening. And I'm using, you know, I'm using poetic <laughs> license here, but please continue because this speaks to the VIX. Yeah. Well, and, and again, I mentioned this before. This is just, you can't get ahead of this. The move index is interesting. We don't talk about this very often because it's kind of a snore to talk about usually, but the move index is what measures bond volatility. The VIX is obviously usually the headline maker. But first of all, bonds are not something that should be more volatile than stocks. Okay. And they have been in the last week or so. You see the move index spiking higher than the VIX even did. Again, not a sign of stable market conditions. Here's what I would say about the VIX and the move. These conditions, and the VIX, I think the VIX is still too low here, but these conditions are why you get swings on a daily basis of we're up 100, then we're down 200, then we're back up. That's volatility. And as long as this stays elevated, or as long as, I think Dan called it once, ready to party, the VIX looked ready to party, as long as it's still at the party, you're going to be able to see swings like that in a daily market pattern or in a weekly market pattern. And those swings are almost impossible to catch. Mm -hmm. So I know I've used this song as a reference before. Kenny Rogers, the great Kenny Rogers. I'm a country fan. I can't help myself. Oh. But The Gambler. And I'm telling you, that song has like every investing lesson in it that anybody ever needs to know. Maybe, maybe you need a little bit of life's a dance. You learn as you go. But The Gambler, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. OK, also, you never count your money when you're sitting at the table. So damn straight. A couple things right now. I'm holding. OK, I'm not I'm not selling into volatility and I, I wouldn't recommend somebody else sell into volatility. I think that this has been a pretty well telegraphed spook session. Right. So I'm assuming that many people have already moved into cash or they've become uh, allured by the short end of the Treasury curve. So this is a time when you got to know when to hold them. You wait it out and see what happens. What I would say about that, you never count your money when you're sitting at the table. To anybody out there who thinks that lower rates are just a straight up line for big tech and growth, don't count your money right now. It's Thank you for that. That was wonderfully done. And I could not agree with you more. I will just add to that before we get to butters that I was at a craps table many years ago and you know, when you're playing craps and doing well, you just collect your chips and put them in your rack. And at one point, I think they were changing box people, which gave me an opportunity to sort of count my chips. And the person I was standing next to literally hit me and said, what the bleep are you doing? So that was a was lesson. That you don't count. Was it Kenny Rogers? <laughs> no, it was not. It was not pre um it was not pre uh, surgically whatever <laughs> Kenny Rogers, who's had more work done to him than uh, Joan Rivers and, oh, and Goldie Hawn combined. Uh, no. So anyway, sorry about that, Kenny. Uh, thank you for that. 
It's time. You know what time? But Liz, tell me what time it is. Uh, it's time for butters. By the way, I like my bagels with butter, not cream cheese. In case anybody cares. Thank God. By the way, I, I do appreciate. I if if and when I'm inclined to get a bagel, <laughs> which is seldom these days, I'm trying to keep my girlish figure. I will toast it and put butter on it. Um, Absolutely. Cream cheese, gross. It's just gross. Mm. So is lox, by the way. I mean, anything. <laughs> ugh. The whole thought of that is just frightening to me. I mean, you go to the bagels. How old do you think the friggin' lox in that deli cabinet is? Don't eat that shit. Uh, butters. And we're bringing up butters today. By the way, I should do this better if we want to clip it. Now it's time for John Butters' Fact Set Earnings Insight. And this is a good one because... I'm going to read a little bit here. This speaks to buy ratings on stocks. And we talked a little before the show. Right now, 53.4% of ratings on S&P 500 stocks are buy ratings. Below the peak of 57.5 at the end of February 22nd and below the five-year average. So we can continue to read on. My question to you, Liz, is this. Is this, do you think, a bit of a counter indicator? In other words, we have fewer buy ratings on stocks and maybe analysts are zigging when they should be zagging thoughts on that uh okay here's the weird part about this fewer buy ratings but i still think earnings estimates are, are too high mm -hmm. so something about it doesn't match up uh, i think that the headline is where they're being conservative but the dollar amount is where they're still being a little bit delusional so uh i don't think that this is a, a counter indicator yet but I like it in the sense that we've been waiting for analysts to sort of capitulate and admit that maybe it wasn't going to be as great as we thought. Here's the other thing, though. We're talking about this in the beginning of 2023. I actually think the estimates for 2024 are the ones that are becoming more and more delusional. So uh, the capitulation probably has yet to happen, at least in the dollar amount. And I would expect that the buy ratings, maybe they kind of chug along here in a range for a while before they start to go back up. Let's pull up Tim Ferguson real quick. Um, thank you for this, Tim. I appreciate it. Tim says that his big flush is after the show. <laughs> Hurry up, Liz and Guy. I'm so sorry to hear that, Tim. I hope things work out well for you. Uh, before oh. we leave here, um, we don't rehearse these things. So one of my favorite Clint, East, Clint Eastwood movies, um, you know, Dirty Harry, He'll walk up to somebody and say, "Ready, get ready for your props." Well, do, you feel, right do you feel? Do you do you feel punk? <laughs> <laughs> and for you Met fans out there, and it might be too early, but you saw what uh -huh. happened to your closer last night. So it's looking like the season is going to turn into a great big giant <laughs> bagel. <laughs> Oh man, I'm a Mets fan. I know you are. I it's hope it doesn't turn into a big zero. That's so good. We again, <sighs> we don't rehearse this shit. I'm just telling you right now, it's the no. best thing you're going to see on any no. any medium. Uh, but that's it for today. I want to thank EY from SoFi. Uh, Dan is mortified somewhere on a plane, somewhere. no doubt. Yeah. But you know that's what happens when you go away. They, it's that old saying: you go away and shit's going to happen, or something like that. The mice will play. Yeah, so or that the mice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank. I'd rather be a terrapin. Yes. You oh, it's always better to be a terrapin <laughs> than a tortoise. Boomer Siason, by the way, from the University of Maryland for you playing our home game. Think fact set financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Thank you, John Butters, for your thoughtful work. Thank you. So far. Get your money right. All in one app. Unless something crazy happens tomorrow. We'll be back on Monday. Dan will be here. Liz, thank you. Thank our audience and folks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Ah! <laughs>